Welcome to the Rejected Religion Podcast. I'm Stephanie Shea. This month's episode is a special listener response to my previous podcast episode 17 with Ewald von Rein and Pariki Moore. My guest is Michael Carter, who is an artist and teacher living in Los Angeles, California. Michael holds a Master of Fine Arts from Claremont Graduate University in California, shows his work in live performances, gives lectures, and has exhibited works in both America and Europe. After episode 17 was uploaded, Michael reached out to me with an interest in continuing the conversation about the esoteric in art, and had some excellent talking points already in mind. Michael's personal interest in theosophy plays a large role in his own research into the spiritual dimensions of abstract art, something that is often left out of the conversation, but is of great importance if we are to fully understand what abstract art is all about. The discussion that follows includes Michael's personal opinions and research, about the history of spiritual movements as they relate to the category of modern abstract art, as well as his own personal background as an artist and spiritual seeker. He also discusses his essay regarding metaphysical art, explaining his ideas about the two categories of spiritual art, and his own work with a pendulum. We talk a bit about art theorist Jack Burnham's ideas about kinetic art, and then move to a discussion about the condition of the theosophical movement today, including his opinions about whether or not today's artists feel comfortable expressing their own spiritual questioning as it is reflected in their art. Plus, much, much more. I hope you enjoy this discussion. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to be able to talk with you today. And thank you again for reaching out to continue the discussion about esotericism and art. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. I was really excited about the previous episode where you had kind of delved into these ideas. And it's a very close topic to my heart. And I was just excited to be able to continue that conversation with uh, people who were you know, informed and had some idea of these ideas. Excellent. I, it's my pleasure to talk uh, to talk with you. Uh, but before we uh, get, we get into all of the details about uh, your personal journey as an artist, uh, I'd like to start by touching on a few points regarding the category of modern art and its relation to spiritual movements, so that the listeners. We'll have a context for our later discussion, and I'm referring to my notes here. Uh, right. For this, I'm drawing on the book that you recommended, The Spiritual and Art Abstract Painting, 1890 to 1985, and in particular, the essay by Maurice Tuchman uh, called Hidden Meanings in Abstract Art, as well as drawing on uh, points that you've made in your lecture for the Philosophical Society in 2019 that can be found on YouTube about Hilma of Klint. So, as uh, Tuchman explains in his essay, many people misunderstand abstract art altogether and even find it meaningless. Uh, could you discuss the cultural context of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and why abstraction was considered an interesting route for artists of that time to explore? What was going on at that time that made abstraction so attractive to artists? Yeah, uh, I think that what I can do is, uh, you know, give my perspective as a practicing artist. Okay. Uh, just sort of like what I've witnessed through my own research. You know, I obviously being a, an artist engaging with these things is different than being an art historian. And so, like, I, I kind of, through osmosis and through a lot of research and a lot of investigation on my own, have kind of, like, observed certain kinds of patterns 
I think that there's a couple of trends which were sort of in the air at the time, and also I think some so- social and cultural forces that were happening that kind of positioned these things. You know, the first kind of point that I look to is that there's already uh, an interest that's coming out of the, the symbolist era in terms of communication. You know, artists are thinking about um, how do we communicate mood? How do we communicate feeling? Uh, is there some way that um, we can, in a, a way that is separate from language, communicate our intention as artists, what we want our, the work to say? And so you already see this um, this kind of uh, tendency in the uh, late 19th century to be you know, seeking like a language of form and color. And ideas about synesthesia are moving around a lot. You know, I think um, there is also some kind of historic kind of trends of like color music or color organs are also kind of floating mm-hmm. around. Mm-hmm. And so there's like a lot of these different kinds of lines that are happening out there. And that our artists, I think, are thinking beyond the, you know, this kind of academic formula of naturalism and uh, increased kind of studio, the naturalism in studio painting and the artificiality that exists in studio painting. And they're looking maybe for something else. And so I think what then comes into this is, you know, these other kinds of these cultural forces that, uh, to me, I think, represent the kind of like, uh, proto new age, right? They represent mm-hmm. all these ideas as they um, eventually then really most dramatically appear within the uh, doctrines and materials of the Theosophical Society. Right. So I think the other thing that, uh, so, you know, one of the interesting things that I've kind of observed in general is that, um, uh, you know, the first decade of the 20th century offset printing is developed. So, you know, you have this, this transition that happens in terms of the visual materials that are accompanying. There is, you know, if you look at the materials that are being created by these different metaphysical organizations, uh, you know, coming in the late Victorian age, it's, you know, dense books of uh, closely set type. Uh, it's all writing. And what happens in the first decade of the 20th century is there's this explosion of visual materials that come along with it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that what happens is many artists are responding to those materials. Uh, most specifically, too, within the Theosophical Society, there is a collection of, of doctrines, of materials that are called the esoteric instructions. And these are like the first set of uh, materials that, um, you know, primarily H.P. Uh, Blavatsky is giving to her close students uh, but they're also being distributed worldwide at a certain point. And these are actually um, themselves very visual and graphic, and they have their their explanations of theories of color that are being used to create a kind of cosmological system. And so I think that also the artists are really gravitating towards these things. They're gravitating towards the visual materials. And the the you know, one of the core aspects of this doctrine is this specific thing that, you know, through sound and through shape and through color, you know, all manifested reality is is invented, is um, brought into existence. And I think this is very attractive to the artists of that era who are maybe looking for some other kind of um, content or motivation for their work. It's an interesting point, and something just popped into my head. Did did the spirit photography of spiritualism uh, have any influence on this as well, about the, the possibility of capturing the invisible realm? Yeah, and that's, that, I mean, that, again, you know, I, I think that um, if you have seen the, uh, the documentary, um, I'm, I can't, I'm not going to remember how to pronounce her last name at the moment, but the recent uh, Beyond the Visible, the documentary on Hilmoff Clint. That, uh, yes, was yes. There's a wonderful segment in there where um, Helena puts together all of the discoveries that are being made in terms of the physical sciences at this moment. The discovery of radio waves, the discovery of radiation, the, right. the, the, all of these, um, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum. These yeah. things are all... coming into existence. And so this is actually also like a really 
uh, significant aspect at this moment, uh, especially in the kind of transition from uh, 19th to 20th century, is that many of these um, uh, doctrines and even predictions that are coming out of the early theosophical movement, uh, they're basically saying, like, look, we're being validated right? Like, look at what is coming out of the material sciences. Our view is actually being validated in real time. And so it's definitely something that's in the air in terms of the cultural uh, conversations that are happening at that moment. Uh, and I think, you know, you know, as I um, mentioned in, in the essay that I shared with you mm -hmm. on sort of reflecting on, you know, different trends in metaphysical art, that Spirit photography or the whole range of those things is definitely a, um, a precursor to this visualization of the invisible. Very good. Okay, so that's happening uh, then in the kind of cultural context. Yeah. Uh, in our prior communication, you brought up another in interesting point that I'd like you to expand on uh, about what specifically was going on uh, within the theosophical doctrines uh, that artists of that time were responding to. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, totally. So I think I kind of touched onto this when we were talking about why abstraction itself was appealing. You know, there's many of these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, I think that the situation with the, the theosophists and the theosophical society is, you know, also being um, one of the things that I think is driving it is that, um, you know, membership is basically happening um, within the sort of same communities that are, uh, the artists are, partic are partic participating in. So there is, uh, you know, the patron class, the collector class, the, um, the chairs of art departments uh, throughout Europe oftentimes were involved in theosophical movements themselves. So, you know, um, anecdotally, Hilma of Klint, uh, the chair of the department that she was studying in, he was a theosophist and he attended um, theosophical meetings. So there was like, and then, you know, much like some of the earlier um, esoteric movements, Neoplatonism, uh, Hermeticism, and things like that of previous generations, this was a, a, a phenomena the late, you know, nineteenth century theosophical phenomena was uh, initially moving through, um, you know, the upper classes, right, mm -hmm. the academic classes and things like that. So, um, so th that is naturally where uh, artists find their patronage, right. and so yeah. there is a, you know, that kind of attraction I think is happening. Um, I th as I think as was sort of mentioned before. The, directly in terms of the doctrine, it is this whole idea of the centrality of color and the mm. centrality of, um, you know, what eventually becomes called the doctrine of the seven rays. And that, and which is, uh, you know, taking the, the, the seven color spectrum that is very familiar and building a whole cosmological system around that. And the possibility that that is a very, um, a very the history or the the lineage of that doctrine goes back you know deeply into time i think was also attractive to some degree i see so they're you know there's they're getting these things they're they are they are getting uh, materials and publications that themselves are filled with imagery there is a constant focus on the use of color and form there is um you know new ideas as um, as um, as its spiritual texts from other con other cultures are being translated mm. into English, French, German, etc. Right, for the very right. first time, right. and so I think that there is a sense of you know um, newness and possibility in these ideas, and that the artists of that generation were attracted to. Right, and another uh, another book that came out, this was a little bit, I guess you would call this later uh, Theosophical Society, but the very influential Thought Forms book yeah. talked about color being associated with emotions yeah. or with uh, addictions or, you know, it could be positive or negative. And then this whole idea of that, that your thoughts can become entities in their own right uh, that have these colors associated with them and then that in the in the book itself there's the that page with the uh or pages with the uh with the chart 
that you see the, the different colors representing different emotions, different qualities. Um, so, um, yeah, I thought that was uh, also very interesting how we see that type of thing uh, permeating through our present day culture. If you if you think about, you know, how what well, how would I call it? I mean, I don't want to I don't want to demean it or criticize it, but if you're if you're looking at kind of like our popular culture type of new age, quote unquote, I know a lot of people don't like that term, but this type of contemporary spirituality and you have a lot of people, you know, talking about this, about how we're talking now about mindfulness and about meditation and about you know, get, finding balance and, and all of these types of uh, concepts, that there are colors that are associated with that. And I would pretty much guess that that's where this is all coming from. It's not, it's not, they're, they're not inventing anything new. Like you had said uh, yeah. earlier before we started this recording, there's really nothing new <laughs> under the sun. It's kind of, uh, things keep coming back, keep returning. So yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah. They return. But they do not. They do not return identically. Right. right? It's not that yeah. it's. It's not that it's. You know, the clock face where it's it's noon over and over and over again. <laughs> but it's more like a, a spiral extending. You know, yeah. through time. Yeah. And so we we they are re and they are you know uh, perennialism. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not the it's not the same flower that blossoms season after season. But the flower does return consistently in a in a new um, materialization yes. in a new um, in a way that is relevant for its time at that particular moment. Exactly, you you worded that perfectly. So thank you for for making <laughs> that distinction. Um, okay, so theosophy was you know very important uh, in this period of time, but. Strangely enough, you note that artists didn't really feel at home in the Theosophical Society, and I, uh, I thought this was an interesting point that you made in your lecture about uh, Hilmar Klint. Uh, I was curious to know why this group didn't really support the artists that were so drawn to its ideas. And a second part to this question, uh, was there any other movement, or were there other movements, that did support artists who were concerned with the spiritual in art? Yeah, I, I think you, uh, that question, I, I think you are uh, remembering actually a, a quote that I was making in one of the talks and that I was actually quoting um, uh, Rudolf Steiner from his biography. Oh. He was discussing why he breaks with the Theosophical Society. Okay. And so it's, but it's, it's an interesting, it's an yeah. interesting uh, question because I think one of the things that becomes very clear when you look at the, um, you know, the 20th century, the, especially the early 20th century Theosophical Society is that as a whole, that they, the members, that, that movement wouldn't, did not seem particularly drawn to abstraction. They did not seem to even consider, I mean, this was one of these things that kind of emerged with um, of Clint's, you know, uh, reception uh, recently was like, is this actually art? Are these diagrams? Was this this kind of reactionary criticism that you would often hear? And I think that many of the, the rank and file theosophists, even the, the leadership, would not have been able to find, uh, would not have been able to actually understand what the these um, artists who were inspired by these things, who were, who were inventing abstraction, so-called, at this time period. And so there is a definite kind of, like, tension there. Uh, you know, one of the very last uh, essays that um, Blavatsky wrote was this thing called Civilization, the Death of Art and Beauty. And she definitely makes this strong, art, like, anti-modern argument for the way that uh, Western-style dress is permeating all these other cultures and, you know, displacing the, the cultural uh, fashions that, that, you know, she's seeing in different cultures. And so the, there, there are definitely, I think, in the early days, this, you know, uh, when sort of symbolism in the late uh, 19th century was, was dominant, uh, there, there was definitely a, a close inner reaction. I mean, um, Jean de Vie, who is a very well-known symbolist, uh, Belgian symbolist, he was a, a president of the Belgian Lodge. He founded it. 
And so, um, you know, uh, Reginald Matchell is another. He was a member of a uh, British artist who is a member of the Academy, and he was very uh, closely involved. So I think, as, you know, there was, a, there was actually like a lot of uh, support and uh, a place for um, more naturalistic art initially. But then when this, this shift happens that, you, that we are now talking about as abstraction, those artists don't seem to find the same kind of um, connection. And going back to your, you know, original question, the section in um, Steiner's autobiography where he discusses this, you know, th this, he actually makes the fact that uh, he doesn't feel like there is enough support for the visual arts in the Theosophical Society as one of the reasons for his, um, um, you know, schismatic break that eventually happens in the 20s. Um, you know, the, the Munich Congress is this example where he tries to build this total, uh, you know, total work of visual art and uh, spiritual content. And, you know, what he says in the autobiography is this caused a lot of tension within the members. You know, his, um, his argument was basically that there was at that point that the focus on a, a transcendental idea of spirituality you know that the uh, physic that the the material world and physicality was something that needed to be overcome. Uh, you know that we should put all of our focus towards um, a, a, a elevation to a future spiritual life. Meant that the visual arts were being denigrated because they were material, and that's you know. I think you have. To, I think to fully unpack that question, you have to really go much deeply into what's going on, what is theosophy, and whether it is emphasizing purely the transcendent, which I think is one thread, or there is also um, the imminent, and therefore this uh, equal valuation of the spiritual and the material. So in your opinion, do you think that Steiner was justified in in criticizing the viewpoints that art wasn't being appreciated because it didn't uh it didn't achieve this spiritual reality that the the theosophists were seeking? I in my own uh, you know engagement and participation with the Theosophical Society is is unusual because I entered into this entire conversation through um, the orthodox fundamentalist theosophical lodges, which I think most people don't even know exist. <laughs> They're very, very small. There's actually a very large, uh, the, one of the main centers is in The Hague and the Blavatsky House. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they are not as um, iconoclastic. But the, the largest and my real encounter with um, the living theosophical movement and my, uh, I've been an associate of the United Lodge of Theosophists for seven or eight years, it, the group, that group is, is um, iconoclastic. There is no, it looks like a, um, like a Lutheran Christian uh, church, right? There's, there's no imagery, there is no art, there is no these things. So I think that this this tendency um, to um, denigrate the material and the physical and thus devalue the visual arts is definitely like a, um, a a trend that can express itself with certain readings of uh, the theosophical doctrines. Hmm. But obviously, if you look at say the um, the Indian based, when most people say that Theosophical Society, what they're talking about is the Theosophical Society um, Adyar, or just we call it Adyar. And that is the one that is based in India. And that one has always had a very visual aspect mm. to it. It is kind of more like the Catholic version, um, <laughs> and, uh, literally. And, um, yeah. and so, you know, to different degrees there. I, I, I may have totally departed from your initial question. Like, this is such a big, um, <laughs> there's so much to, like, why this is and what this is. And, you know, it depends, like, if you look at, you know, if you look at different eras of what the different leadership is putting out and saying, and then you, 
go back to look at what Blavatsky is saying. Like, it's really a matter of like, well, who's, whose version of theosophy do you want to accept? And right. then a lot of then these, um, you know, uh, emphasis on the, uh, the transcendent or the separation between the material and the spiritual um, becomes more heightened. But if you want to read it in another way, yeah. it's less so. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that happens oftentimes when you start talking about things, you're like, wait a minute, this is not just one <laughs> cut and dry answer. It's not really that, uh, that simple. It's quite nuanced dependent upon a lot of other factors. So yes, I totally understand what you're talking about. <laughs> totally understand. Okay, so now, okay, so we've kind of established that, okay, so there, there's these ideas going around and that artists are uh, attracted to it, interested in it. So the, the, the spiritual in art, trying to um, portray the spiritual in art was popular for many artists. But what was happening in this period that made it unpopular for artists to be associated with spiritual, occult, or mystical ideas, which I find also quite an interesting uh, aspect yeah. of the story? I, I think, again, I, this is another example of many fronts. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think part of it is just a changing zeitgeist, mm. you know, for a moment, um, you know, you brought up thought forms before. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at um, Tuchman's catalog and you go through and you just look at how many times in that catalog he discusses artists in the first decade or two of the 20th century referring to thought forms, discussing it. It was really, it was, you know, there was a, a decade or two where it was, an, it was an obsession among so many artists. And so I think partially just what happens is, you know, fashion, like things mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, um, I also think that what happens too is there is, at least um, in the Americas, as there is a kind of like move from, you know, this standard narrative that we discuss about the center of the art world moving from Western Europe to Eastern, the Eastern U.S., uh, you know, whether or not you are going to accept that. There was a sense that these ideas were Victorian and they were also ideas that were European. They were coming in through the European artists. And so I think that at least in terms of American art history, um, there was a sense of, um, oh, that's, we, we're going to do something else. Like we are, we're going to do our own thing. And the interests of the previous generation, we're going to leave those behind. And so I think that, you know, that kind of um, uh, relentless change that is happening, I think part of it was sort of left behind in that. The other thing that really happens, too, is that the Theosophical Society, the kind of the real, uh, you know, flag carrier of this moment, goes through an enormous number of crises in the early 20th century. Um, and and repeated um, schismatic breaks and internal conflicts, the entire interest of the um, TS moves from this kind of um, investigation of the invisible worlds and comparative religion, philosophy, and science to different messianic projects. And so this is the whole era of the world teacher and Krishnamurti mm -hmm. and the entire move, entire internal energy of the, the society then redirects itself towards these ends. And I think that that, um, and then, you know, that of course culminates in the eventual uh, collapse of those efforts, uh, you know, with uh, Krishnamurti uh, repudiating the organizations that are built mm -hmm. around him. And so I think that that, you know, then artists who are now in the 20s and 30s watching this happen, they're just like, I'm going to stay out of that. Like, whatever was interesting before, this has clearly gone in some different direction. And so, I'm going to look for something else. So I think that that was also largely um, had a big impact. Mm. Well, after um, that, though, there was also a political uh, aspect of, uh, of the whole appropriation of particular ideas uh, that, yeah, ended up uh, being used by certain members of the Nationalist Socialist uh, Party and uh, of Hitler's uh, uh, group 
Uh, I can also understand why artists wouldn't want to be associated with those ideas because you know, I, I have a, I have a, a slightly different perspective on what that is and what. Oh, happened. okay. Tell me. And, I'm very interested. Um, which is, you know, there is, uh, there is this phrase from economics uh, that I heard before, which is that a rising tide lifts all boats. And so I think that really, you know, this, I think the narrative that we want to say that um, different kinds of national socialist um, um, uh, fascist organizations in Europe appropriating these things, I really think that that it's almost like the reverse where we're talking about a phenomena that is actually affecting everybody. And so really like what it's, you know, metaphysics is uh, the new age in general is above uh, left or right politics, Mm -hmm. right? This is really something that is pulling everybody in this new direction. And so really that these ideas um, were, that um, that they would pop up in these movements, or that they would inform these uh, movements that then lead to, you know, great uh, tragedy in the, in the 20th century, is almost more of a historical revision. These things were influencing everybody. Uh, mm. the, the, these these new religious movements, these spiritual movements, are affecting everybody, regardless of where you are in terms of your politics or worldview. Good point. Uh, and, everybody is using them. And so I don't even like, I don't know that. I mean, my impression is that if we had been present in those times, I don't think that we would have automatically associated German national socialism with occultism. I don't think that that would have been like a, yeah, you know, if anything, those groups were persecuting and oppressing. They were shutting down um, all of the theosophical lodges. They are shutting down all the anthroposophical lodges. Mm-hmm. They are sending masons to uh, death camps. Like there is, yeah. there is. If anything, they're oppressing these organizations. And so, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you yeah. know, I think that. Um, um, obviously, the volatility of the world wars changes everything. Uh, but I don't think that that is the reason why artists pulled away from these movements. Or, again, I think that there was just uh, other things that seemed more mm. pressing. At the time. Yeah, that's yeah, good, good, good observation. Point taken. I think it's afterwards that people started to look at um, that the ideas, concepts that were being used, and then they started to see. Oh, there's some kind of connection there. Uh, yeah, appropriated, changed, altered. But yeah, it, this all came after the fact. And I think that's what leads to the, this is a little I'm going into a broader context now, but I think that would, that is what leads to a lot of thinking nowadays by lay people that anything associated with a cult can be automatic, automatically linked to fascism and, and, and all these other types of ideologies that are, less uh yeah for 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 most people less uh desired less attractive and yeah. that has made just as an aside that has made the study of western esotericism in academia very difficult to establish because it always has this underlying assumption that people who are interested in that that area that field are automatically going to be uh, fascists or uh, going to be attracted to those types of ideologies. There's been this link made between the two that really it, it shouldn't be made. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of a fabricated link. Uh, but just because of things that were happening in, in history that now looking back on it, as you said, the, yeah, you, the Masons were being, <laughs> shipped off you know it, it yeah, yeah. The, if you're looking at what was really happening you know no i i would agree with you i don't think that you would make that uh assumption uh directly if you look at what yeah. is actually happening at that time it's after the fact that all of this stuff starts to become quite uh quite difficult yeah there's, i mean there's, there's i mean there's i think 
you know, one thing uh, anecdotally that's really interesting is, you know, in the process of doing research, I've gone back and looked at, um, you know, the theosophist that's being published in the 40s, right? And at a certain point, you know, every month they will say, this is what's going on in each, um, you know, each uh, di- um, jurisdiction, each country, and this is what the lodges are doing, and these are the membership numbers, and, you know, these are revenues. And then at a certain point, they're just, they, you know, in when World War II really gets underway, every time they come to Germany, they're like, we have no, they just like, instead of the list, there's just a comment that says, we have no idea what's happening, We've lost touch with everybody. Mm. We have no contact with our members who are in the country now. And so, you know, that tells a very different story about what is happening on the ground. Yeah. And I think what had happened. The other aspect of all of this is, you know, what we are always, I think, describing is the third option. You know, the two dominant uh, cultural forces that we are still operating underneath, uh, you know, materialism Mm -hmm. on one hand, uh, which is the, you know, the academy more and more is uh, the bearer of that. And then, of course, you know, the Christian uh, worldview. And so if you think about what we are talking about is literally the historic um, antagonist to both of those worldviews. <laughs> so, right, like on one hand, the 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 academic materialist is simply saying that like, you are simply deluded. This is um, a regression of consciousness. This is uh, a false narrative. This is uh, you know um, a mask for uh, a mental illness. This yeah. is you know with all these other ways of psychologizing it. Yeah. And on the other hand, if you are coming, you know obviously, um, even still more so in America, um, that, you know, the, this is simply evil, right? This is like, if we, right, like, this is not, this is literally the, the historic narrative that we have been using to describe the forces of evil for a thousand years now. You are literally it. Like, there's yeah. no ambiguity behind that. So I think that, like, those two <laughs> things have then, you know, created this idea that this third option uh, the metaphysical view um, is either deluded or evil. And then that's the condition that we are constantly operating. Yeah. Very interesting insights there. I <laughs> really appreciate that. That's uh, you're really, you're really blowing me away with how you're explaining all of this stuff. I'm really, I'm really enjoying this. This is really, uh, really feeding my brain. I really love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you so much for that background. And okay, so we have a context that we that we have established here. Uh, I'd like now to move to your own work. Uh, but could you talk first more about your own story as as an artist and the the quote unquote seeker? Yeah, I mean, I you know I came into this through a very um, you know indirect route. And that uh, I was raised in a very progressive household, you know, um, you know, my mother was a very ardent, progressive, uh, second wave feminist, um, you know, an anti-religionist. And so that was really the background that I came into. However, my father's family going back centuries are um, religious workers my dad went to seminary initially. My uncle is a missionary. My cousin is a pastor. My grandparents founded a church in their living room. Uh, you know, the, the dedication to not just um, have faith as a part of your life, but to work for that faith uh, has, is, you know, is like a, is a through line in my family. And so um, I, I initially rejected all of that. And so it was only through uh, this kind of what initially started as an art historical process, I would, you know, in um, starting my arts education, I would get these, um, you know, projects, uh, assignments, uh, make an abstract painting. And I was like, what, what is an abstract painting? And they would say, oh, it's, it's, it's a painting with an ambiguous figure ground relationship. And I was like, okay, that doesn't even begin to describe what, right? <laughs> and and these kinds of things like that. And then, uh, so I, um, and then very rarely, this would have been the 90s or so, or mid 90s, you know, really pre-internet, then um, I would rarely, very occasionally get, hear these phrases, and they would say something like, well, you know, Kaninsky was a theosophist. 
and then nothing else. No context, no information, no references, as if we were supposed to. Right, that. just automatically. Uh, yeah, and, um, and I thought that was very strange. And then, so I, I you know, kind of just uh, through feeling essentially like lost in my own life, uh, you know, working towards different goals, uh, interested in, um, okay, I think I'm going to uh, be involved in the entertainment industry, you know, producing media content, interested in new te- technology and digital media and things like that, but feeling very, um, um, like, feeling very unsatisfied with that. And simultaneously, I started having, I had a, um, a friend at the time who, um, you know, directed me to try out a, a, a yoga class because I was having all of these issues from sitting at the desk all the time. Mm. And, um, and then simultaneously, I was also starting to have some very um, initial ex- uh, psychedelic experiences. And so I discovered immediately from those two that the experiences that I were having was wildly different than everyone else. Uh, whatever people were partying and um, having these kinds of experiences, what I was experiencing was something radically different. And um, at the same time, my initial encounters with yoga, for whatever reason, uh, uh, the physical yoga, hatha yoga, I kept on, you know, non the, the those coincidental non-coincidences I um, (laughs) kept on running into basically very um, orthodox classes everything is in Sanskrit Um, everything is done very traditionally but like at a gym and so this very strange you know (laughs) situation and um, and so that basically led to real spiritual experiences and I started really you know now that I was able to access the idea of the spiritual through the physical outside of my cultural, uh, you know, um, Protestant Christian family history, it was like this entirely different thing. And that, you know, eventually I discovered that all of that, these two things were actually converging. And it was really um, when I, as a, as I began to develop as an artist and as I develop, began to ask more and more questions about, well, what happened in the early 20th century? What caused all of these artists to just like, you know, take hundreds of years of, of, of uh, naturalism, increasing goals for these things and just like do this break, right? Like literally within a, like a decade, because no one could tell me or give me a really good reason for that. Yeah. Um, and eventually those things all just connected and I realized, oh, wait, that's what this is. Like this, you know, the, the once, you know, this is what these artists were engaged with. This is what was causing this massive change. I want to know what that is. And that led to my, you know, participation. Then I was like, I can't do this as a ironic postmodernist move. I can't do this as a detached academic research. I really have to find some way to participate Mm -hmm. because there's no way to really know what these things are to internalize them, to, to understand it from a cultural perspective um, without really participating in some way. And that's what led me to the place I am now. That's very interesting, and I, of course, my my comment that I'm going to make has, of course, is not on the same level as your own personal <laughs> experience. But when I was reading that book that you uh, that you strongly uh, suggested that everyone gets, 
uh, which I yes, now I totally understand why you were so so (laughs) adamant about it. But the 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 thing for me was the whole idea about abstract art. I could totally understand because I felt that way too. I didn't understand what was going on there, but what this book is, is, and I'm so enjoying reading it, what this book is showing is that there's this really big puzzle piece that's being left out in a lot of conversations about abstract art, is that yeah. there is this spiritual component. And once you have that puzzle piece, then things start to kind of, all the pieces start to fall into place. And then you feel like, oh, now I'm starting to understand what all of these triangles and squares and circles mean. And what the color of that triangle means and why there's those wavy lines there and, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, then it's like, oh, now I'm starting to get it. It's like the, you know, the light bulb comes on and it starts to make sense. So, I mean, you're doing this then as, as an artist, of course, I'm just, you know, someone who's interested in wanting to understand it. But I think, I think we're both probably starting out in the same place of asking, you know, what? what is all of this about? What is, what does this mean? So, um, so yeah, I would, I would totally add uh, add on and join your, uh, your, your campaign for people to find that book. (laughs) It's, it's kind of amazing. That catalog actually stayed in print until, until really just the last, um, maybe five years ago. Really? Like go to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, you go to their gift store. They were still, when I first moved to LA, they were still selling that catalog 35 years later. Well, it's so, still relatively yeah. easy to get. I found a very inexpensive secondhand copy. And, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have any trouble finding it at all. So, uh, yes. You know, I'm very, very happy to have listened to your <laughs> advice because it's really helping me to to really yeah, get a grip on on what's going on here. So, uh, so thanks for that as well. I'd like to talk a little bit about your article titled "Form Following Spirit: An Investigation of Recent and Your Recent Metaphysical Art." Um, you note that there are two categories of spiritual art: the first being symbolic or diagrammatic, and the second being process art, or art that is produced by energetic processes or practices. Could you talk a little bit first about what what that is, what this means? So when I was thinking about what I was observing in terms of patterns or trend in art that we identify as being spiritual or art that we identify as metaphysical, you know, what I was starting to see is that there were these two really uh, sort of strong categories. You know, one of them is something I think that we all um, uh, identify or associate with um, with spiritual art, especially, you know, um, esoteric or occult spiritual art. Uh, and that is, you know, sacred geometry, right? The, mm-hmm. the use of symbolism, the use of complex kind of diagrammatic charts. Uh, and things like that, and and a lot of what I think circulates as as um, spiritual art um, sort of pulls from that well, uh, even symbolic in the sense of like you know less uh, occulty, more new agey uh, images of auras and you know chakra poles and people mm-hmm. in Padmasana and these kinds of very um, definite um, tropes of, of that. And so I, you know, that's, again, the kind of dominant, it's definitely like the vernacular idea of spiritual art. If you look at the, um, through social media, what you see primarily is that kind of, mm. that as spiritual art. Mm-hmm. And I think part of, um, so that was one sort of category. But I was also aware, specifically within the kind of domain of, you know, uh, quote, fine art, um, the art that is sort of academically discussed and circulated that exists in institution, there is this whole other type of work being made. And that if you start to look at the, um, the, the backgrounds and the interests of those artists, you realize, oh, this other art, this art made through systems and processes Uh, is actually something that seems to emerge uh, repeatedly from these other kinds of artists. 
So, you know, a really great example, you know, uh, in the, I uh, picked out a few examples in the essay, you know, um, Klein is, of course, Eve Klein is a great example of someone who worked in those ways. And, you know, and his, his interests, his metaphysical interests are very well known and documented. And, you're, you know, the connection between those ideas is very clear. And so he then starts, you know, that type of art then starts to become more and more prevalent towards the later part of the 20th century, really hitting a, a peak in the, the 70s, especially, I think. Uh, there is a, a local artist uh, who I'm a great fan of here in L.A., Lita Albuquerque. She works in these very similar systems uh, doing, you know, uh, pigment paintings where the wind, you know, they will basically throw a handful of uh, pigment into the air and let the wind capture it, um, disperse it onto the surface of a uh, prepared canvas. So another, again, it's like uh, this same process of visualizing invisible forces or visualizing natural systems, um, again, like occluded or, you know, occulted systems. And that shows up again and again, right? Um, um, Joseph Boy's work, right? The the one example that I use in my thing is the, um, you know, the honey pump at the workplace, which was his kind of really well-known piece from Documenta, I think in the early 80s, uh, maybe late 70s, which is this visualization of social uh, forces and networks through this sort of piping system that was installed in the institutional space that literally pumped um, honey uh, through these um, networks of tubes. And so, he's, you know, again, this visualization of, um, of things that are otherwise invisible. And mm. so that's like, I, and then you, when you realize that that is sort of like a, a category, you start to see that there are a lot of artists that are, are historically in the late 20th century, especially using that uh, strategy in their work. And so there is, um, th- that was another, um, you know, clear kind of domain of metaphysically inspired work that I was seeing. Right, and if we look a little bit more closely of at the at the process art, you also mention that this this whole visualization process of these invisible forces also use sound, and you talked about a now I can't remember I don't have the word. It's a particular type of con, uh, construction, a, a, a machine that made particular designs. Now I can't remember the name of it. Is you, were you um, the harmonograph? Yes, that, thank you. That, yeah. that, that machine. Uh, and how you were talking about, and I don't believe it was in the, in the lecture, but I think it was in another interview that you, that, that you did um, that I watched on YouTube, that you talk about uh, because that's a kind of a complex machine that you started using a pendulum because it had kind of that same spiral uh, type of uh, circular spiral type of effect as the as the other machine did. Uh, can you talk more about the ideas beto- behind this type of art production? You know, and and these deeper layers that you've noticed in your own work with the working with the pendulum. Because I thought that was very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So the pendulum, my work with the pendulum comes directly yeah. from thought forms. So there, um, the, part of the whole. So after the um, the uh, you know the section on the uh, color correspondences, where mm-hmm. there's the famous chart, mm-hmm. and they kind of go into that. The, the basically the argue the opening argument of that book is. The laboratory sciences are de- are discovering all of these, you know, aspects of, of the natural world, which are basically invisible to the five senses. And, um, you know, these are some ways it is happening. And the example that they use um, that um, Besson and Ledbetter use in the opening of that book is the, uh, they use the Shaladni plates, right? So the metal... Uh, Ernst Shalodny, he's a scientist, I think, believe he's Italian, 
uh, he uh, basically takes these metal plates and puts sand on them mm-hmm. and then runs the violin bow and yeah. depending on that, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's the, the, those figures are a constant trope of uh, metaphysical thought of the new age of those ideas for the last hundred plus years. Uh, and so then the other example that they use is the harmonograph. And the harmonograph was a kind of um, Victorian uh, parlor amusement. It was literally this, um, you know, uh, two multiple pendulums that had weights on the bottom of them. And they connected to a single point, And that point had a pen of some kind on it. And depending on the different weight ratios you would attach to the pendulum, you know, a pound versus two pounds, The idea was that um, they were almost like um, musical intervals, like harmonic intervals. Mm. And depending on the ratios, the the device would make a different kind of drawing, make a different kind of pattern uh, as it harmonized the different Mm. intervals of the swinging pendulums. Um, And so, you know, again, and that that device becomes a repeating element within thought forms where they, um, the author's, basically say like, look how um, this thing, this machine produces, uh, um, you know, visual imagery, which so closely resembles our clairvoyant investigations of thought forms. Isn't that a fascinating coincidence? And so um, what I, you know, five or six years ago now encountered, finally really encountered thought forms and was reading it, uh, it's filled with all of these um, black and white images uh, of uh, harmonograph drawings. And um, what I uh, discovered in the process of trying to kind of like, could I go back and pick up these art theories of a previous era and continue to build on them is that um, I lack the engineering skill to construct a harmonograph that would work on the scale that I needed. But I could figure out how to use the pendulum. So everything then came out of that. And, you know, that itself is really interesting because uh, working with the pendulum that way, the results are always unique. You know, you you cannot, it's not, uh, you cannot reproduce the same result. Even if you set up the same conditions, it does something different every time. Um, There is a definite, um, you know, combination between, uh, my hand, which is partially, which is present in terms of setting up the system and mm-hmm. setting it in motion. But once it's set in motion, then I s- step away from it until I decide to stop it. So there is this sort of um, um, cooperation between this supra personal uh, cosmic scale force of gravity and my own um, uh, gesture as an artist for instance. And it was really that experience that really keyed me into eventually discovering uh, Jack Burnham and the systems art and discovering that there was this existing art historical um, conversation around this idea. Um, And and what I eventually noticed about the pendulum as I scaled it up to performance scales Mm -hmm. is that um, something really happens that is unquantifiable related to the environment, the circumstances of making the piece, uh, who I am in a relationship with to accomplish the performance. Uh, You could really tell there was something about the harmoniousness of the results that um, would manifest itself almost immediately based on my psychological state, what the environment was like that I was doing the performance in, all of these things, you know, that the the pendulum was literally doing what the pendulum was always intended to do, which was be a sensitive instrument, Mm. a fencing instrument. Um, And and that was, um, you know, that was something that I had no idea would emerge out of these works. Right. Right, yeah. I can imagine. One of the performances that you talked about as well, uh, and you can also see, I think, on your website, uh, you have a, a still photo of it, uh, but it also used sound. Mm-hmm. You had another person there making yeah. sound. And do you notice a remarked difference between the incorporation of sound as without sound, if you're just in a quiet room? 
what the performance you're describing, we had a sound mm -hmm. bowl practitioner, mm -hmm. uh, you know, very, very a lovely person here who regularly does sound bowl ceremonies, healing at mm -hmm. the Philosophical Research Society. And so we collaborated on that piece. And she literally improvised the sound in relationship to the performance as it was happening. And what I oh, did shit. notice was that it, uh, I think especially for the audience, it really heightened the, um, the contemplative, the meditative qualities mm -hmm. of the experience. So, you know, if you think about um, objectively, what happened is people came together and they watched a, um, a pendulum pour paint on a nine foot canvas for like 45 minutes and were totally silent. You know, nobody was uh, checking their phones, nobody was in conversation. There was a total engagement with that event for that time period. Uh, and I think that the um, I know that the sonic aspect of it, trying to kind of take the rhythm of the pendulum, the pendulum, if you know, think about it, goes like in this spiral. Mm -hmm. and that's the same motion that the sound bowl yeah. player form as well. So there was, from the beginning, this idea of trying to kind of like take these two rhythms and harmonize them, um, you know, create uh, something out of, of potential discord that could happen. Uh, and that definitely. Yeah, what is that called? A trainment where you have like things, uh, objects that are moving that are start moving then together. I is that called a trainment? I don't know if that's the right word. But the like uh, when you're sitting in a row of cars and everybody has their right blinkers. <laughs> yeah. On, this like, going for example. Out. <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. The and things the, start to just kind of yeah start to move together in 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 a kind of a pattern, as it were. Did you notice that was happening? Yeah, I, oh, we, interesting. I, I, and we, again, you know, I um, I have we had a very uh, experienced sound bowl player, and so she, in a sense, like almost like a uh, like a jazz musician. You know, mm. improvised her performance, her tones to what was happening um, in that performance. Excellent. In live, it wasn't yeah. rehearsed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just all yeah. improvised and on the spot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Jack Burnham, and uh, in that same article that uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, you you were talking about his kinetic art. Uh, as you know, I would assume that this we're talking about process art here, um, and the reception of these works. And you pointed out that this type of art was considered then, I don't know if it still is considered quote unquote bad art. Uh, I was curious to know more about this. Why was this type of art so criticized, and is it still criticized? Uh, so, I, um, I was quoting uh, Burnham, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. So Jack Burnham is a really fascinating uh, art theorist, art, art educator. Uh, he unfortunately just passed away very recently, and I wasn't ever able to get in touch with him mm. because I discovered his writing kind of in the middle of all of this and was mm. really shocked to uh, discover this peer who whose own trajectory is very fascinating, and I really recommend that if these are topics that are interesting to you as a, as a researcher, as an artist to find his work, um, okay. because it's, you know, it's really what, whatever was happening in the seventies, this moment that we are now experiencing where there is a, um, you know, a, a openness to look into uh, esoteric spirituality to metaphysical motivations was clearly also happening in the seventies as well. And there are many examples of intellectuals and academics and writers and theorists who were tapping into these same kinds of conversations then as well. And Burnham is a great example of that. Um, I think what Burnham was responding to was another uh, Maurice Tuckman production here at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which was the Art and Technology Exhibition. And that's another storied um, uh, catalog and event along other trajectories. And what he was observing was that the critical response to that exhibition 
um, anytime there was uh, artwork that was uh, what he's talking about is kinetic art are things that like literally are mechanically powered art art that requires electricity to run that mm-hmm. is needed to be plugged in in some way and he was observing that there the critical response in the late 70s uh towards that was largely negative that uh many artists many art critics at the time uh, seemed to really focus on having issues with that type of work uh you know when what he but he what he balanced is he noticed that anytime there were works uh, that um, used incorporated uh, natural mechanical functions. That they were um, using some kind of. He's talking about like Hans Hock's work, right? A lot Hock, uh, and um, um, in in that particular way, he sort of noticed that there that there was a greater receptivity towards powering or um, ener- energizing works that weren't using mechanical systems. And if you look in the particular essay that it's involved, I, I can't unpack all of it. I'm still really getting into it. He mm. has these uh, elaborate semiotical, semiotic charts, uh, Klein charts, where he's basically identifying, you know, what are the um, the uh, different types of symbolism that are working in these pieces oh. and what types of things that they are embodying. So Burnham actually makes a very uh, complex argument uh, in that essay as to what he thinks is going on. Uh, and I really would recommend going back to that um, essay, which is called The True Ready-Made from 1972. Okay. I will definitely look into that. Do you have any preliminary uh, ideas that you've, that you've garnered from, from that article about why that type of uh, art would be considered, quote-unquote, bad? I mean, his argument is basically that that it's um, that it is not um, it is sort of not participating in nature. Oh, okay. Nature, uppercase N, nature, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And that and that sort of unconsciously, subconsciously, that is what these uh, art critics and art theorists are identifying, even if they don't know what that is. Right. You mentioned that that in that quote that you included that um, that he says that the more, yeah, I don't know if he used the word naturalistic. I don't know if that was the actual word that he used, but I do recall him saying something about works that were more naturalistic, I guess maybe would be the word, in, I don't know, uh, in, in nature were a little bit more well uh, received. So, yeah, I mean, the example yeah. he uses is the, uh, the chick hatchery. Yeah. Right? Uh, ex- Right, where so there is a, a a power, there is a kinetic energy in there, but the source of that energy is a, a biological process as opposed to being a machine, a mechanical machine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you think that um, that you could say the same thing today? Yeah, that, like that, that judgment. That's interesting. You know, one of the other things that Burnham is a real critic of is. Um, is um, digital art, is any kind of um, software-driven art. I mean, he actually has a whole essay where he talks about, like, uh, art and technology like the, like the, as a failed promise. Mm. And, and so, it, right, I mean, this, you think about this era, this is really, like, where video art really starts to become more widespread. Uh, you know, the digital has, is even, you know, computer artwork of the computer, what we call used to call new media art. I mean, this is really the dawn of all of those things. Uh, and it's interesting. I mean, I would say that, you know, looking at the landscape of, um, you know, what is the bulk of art production, uh, we do really have seem to have come to this, like, uh, you know, the pendulum has swung fully to the opposite end in this era where, you know, at the era Burnham is writing, they are saying, you know, we don't need, why do we even put uh, sculptures on a pedestal? Uh, painting is dead. We, you know, we don't uh, paint. There's no way that painting can ever be a viable uh, vehicle for the arts moving forward. Uh, look, look, all this new technology is fantastic. Uh, let's make video art. We shouldn't be making objects anyways. We're, we're, we're fully dematerializing the art object, which has been a, obsession for a century or more and um and now i feel like the other you know and then we were really big into post-studio does an artist even need a studio 
They, they sh you know, should be working in the public sphere. They should be doing uh, socially engaged artwork. This, this is really where the new art is going to be coming from. And now I think 50 years later, you know, the answer is you have to get a studio. Sculptures go on pedestals. <laughs> Paintings are brightly colored figurative things that go on the wall. And like, that's the, <laughs> right? Like, and I don't want to hear anything else. Like, that, that digital stuff, whatever, you need to make a video to accompany your art for like you're you're going to be selling some paintings it's really nice if you make like a piece of video art to kind of function as um advertising for your objects that you're going to sell right and supplementing really, it supplementing yeah. it yeah yeah, yeah. and it's, that, that's not a hundred percent there are definitely always examples but i think the dominant themes that i am now seeing are we've come to the other e extreme at this moment Okay, now I'm going to go off on a tangent here and ask you what you think about artificial intelligence inspired art. The idea that we would eventually be able to get a software driven result, I mean, has been another one of those obsessions for many years now. Uh, you know, I recall 30 years ago reading uh, illustrators who were having conversations with art directors and saying, you know, pretty, the art director saying pretty soon, we're not even going to need you guys. We'll just like type into a program that I need, you know, a picture like this with these colors and this, and then it'll just pop out something and I'll put that yeah. uh, up instead. But uh, obviously that's not, that's not the case, you know, like the, the wh whatever, um, Artificial intelligence as, is not as smart as we would like it to believe. Uh, and, and it's, you know, clearly much the, the horizon of the, of, uh, of smart, of, of uh, I, I don't, I know there are like these particular uh, terminology in terms of what it means to have a artificial intelligence that um, um, is capable of functioning on many different kinds of, um, capacities y you know it seems more of like a gimmick at this point mm. just like uh, the metaverse just like virtual reality it seems really a, a gimmick like a, a like a solution looking for a problem I, you know I imagine to some to some extent it, it will become a tool it will become another way of, of starting um, work another way of you know producing preliminary ideas of you know, painters will put, you know, will um, put certain terms into an algorithm and it will produce an image and then they'll paint the outcome of that algorithm mm. on a painting, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it will just, I think it will move towards becoming another tool, another way of creating um, imagery. Obviously, you know, the when you remove the optic, you remove the eye, uh, you you know you have the kind of black box of a neural net process. Um, it, you know it 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 opens up the possibility that will it will do things that a person would never do, and so I think that that um, um, I think that artists will be able to draw inspiration from them, inspiration from mm -hmm. that type of work. Um, but I, I feel like the, the general contours won't change that much. Well, thank you for humoring me and answering my <laughs> question. I re I'm, I'm very interested in the whole concept of artificial intelligence and how that might uh, develop into uh, new categories of people and yeah. whether or not uh, we could speak about spirituality in these other type of sentient life forms. So uh, that's a conversation for a different day. I'm going to stay <laughs> on track now and get back to my questions that I have for you. Um, you raised another very interesting uh, question about the condition of the theosophical movement today in relation to other more influential eras and whether or not the theosophical movement still possesses the capacity to influence people. So could you expand your, uh, your ideas and your thoughts about this? So, um, you know, what, one of the things that I made the decision very early on uh, that I mentioned before was, to, you know, to do this, you needed, it wasn't enough 
to um, do this at a remove. I needed to figure out some way to participate mm. directly. And I, there was, and that there was really no way to really understand what had happened and what the, the nature, the character of these uh, influences were like without really becoming involved in some way. And, you know, we definitely are the products of a generation who don't join anything. You know, the collapse in institutions and social organizations is over since the post World War II is dramatic. Um, there's many reasons for that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again and again, it's the conversation that I will have with people is they are saying like, oh, I don't join things. You know, they'll talk about some artist who was interested in these um, esoteric, esoteric and metaphysical ideas, but they never joined directly any society or they weren't a joiner. And, and we, that has somehow become like a, um, a, um, um, a positive quality that we, we say about people, that they don't participate in their cultural institutions. And so, so I, 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 I was like, the only way to really do this is to find some way to participate. And that, and that actually like literally filling out like a, you know, an associate card. And then the associate card literally says simply, it's my determination what this means. <laughs> that there's literally, I, there's no, it's, you know, so hands off that it's like, I myself determine what this commitment means, what, what it is it means to become a member. And I think it was only that kind of language which allowed me to take that mm. step because the idea of joining a spiritual organization is like, I called my friends and I was like, I'm doing this thing. So if I disappear or if I tell you that I'm you know, giving all of my worldly possessions away to this organization, come save me. Right. Oh, so, oh. you know, and you remember in Los Angeles, of course, like we have the constant, you know, the history here and the constant specter of Scientology is also yeah. this thing that is everywhere here. Yeah. And so that it's a very definite conversation. And, and so it's interesting, like, well, what, you know, is the, what is happening? Uh, I, I at, right before the pandemic started, I gave a lecture on Off Clint at um, the Ojai Valley Theosophical Lodge, which is the kind of um, esoteric center of the American branch of the Theosophical Society. And part of that lecture, I did propose these things. I was like, what is, what is, what is, what has happened? Why, if we go back a century, were, were there so many creative individuals of all types of disciplines drawn to these groups and organizations versus now? And I don't, obviously the condition has changed. Obviously the, the dynamics has changed. Mm-hmm. You know, in some ways the Theosophical Society is the victim of its own success, that it's so successfully um, distributed its its ideas and doctrines into the culture that we don't even realize that that was the vehicle anymore. Right. Like, you know, we have, and if anything, there is we're almost experiencing reactionary. Like, oh, that's you know, uh, I, I can't believe you know, Blavatsky is the eternal controversy. Uh, she can never be made safe, and she couldn't be made. She it was impossible to make her safe in 1890 we can do it even less now and so you know that there's i'm you know like i said the reaction to the 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 term the new age and what that constitutes but again all of those ideas you can trace those back to the theosophical society yeah, yeah. you know the fact that we're sitting here having this conversation about these things you can would not have happened without the efforts of those generations of members of these different organizations i agree yeah. so i mean my uh, very astrologically inclined friends will always talk about the nature of the aquarian age which we are supposedly mm-hmm. now into Mm -hmm. and one of the things that they will talk about that zeitgeist is the movement from institutions to individuals you know the movement from uh, a truth or the narrative being formed within institutions and organizations and groups to the idea of people finding um, individual meaning in their own lives uh, through their own efforts 
And so if you accept that I, idea of, um, you know, uh, astrological ages, this, that changes also a zeitgeist uh, that we are all, all experiencing. I, so I think in general, the, the, the Theosophical Society, will it, um, can it regenerate? Like, is there a way that it can, its mission has changed so much from what was happening at that moment when it was so interesting to so many creative individuals, to, to so many people in general? Can, can it regenerate? I think that that is an interesting question. I, I think my participation and involvement was, was partially part of one of the things that came up in the um, podcast episode that I was responding to where they were saying, you know, um, we've moved from this idea of um, drawing attention to these connections and histories to now, as especially as artists, how can we implement these things? How can we uh, work with them? How can we uh, critique them? And I think that that's really where we're at this moment uh, more so is um, the history has happened. Our job in this moment is then to make some is we are in a transitional moment and we have to then go through and look at these events and look at these lines and look at these organizations and say um, uh, what, what is really going to be valuable moving ahead? What should we um, support and connect ourselves with? What you're saying really beautifully dovetails into my next question was, I was curious as to your opinion uh, while artists of the past were reticent about their own spiritual influences and inspirations, they didn't really talk about uh, about about it. And and even in your own uh, story about going to art school and being told that oh, Kandinsky was a theosophist, period, and then nothing else. You know that that whole reticence there. Um, I was wondering if you feel that that has changed. Do you think that artists are, are able to be more open about their own spiritual questioning as it is reflected in their art? How do you feel about that personally? We have been using for like maybe the last uh, 40 years the word sublime. And we've been using that as kind of a mask to uh, obfuscate these conversations. So it's like this single word that has been... Um, doing the job of this incredible range of uh, processes and interests and things. And so I think that this, um, this question of the spiritual in relationship to art has been ongoing. There are definite examples we can look at all throughout the uh, 20th century up to now of artists kind of engaging with these ideas. One of the things that we, you have to understand about the artist's relationship to the market, especially, is that, and this is something that really the kind of why does the spiritual drop away? Why does this language start to fall away, especially as we get towards the middle of the 20th century? And th it becomes this whole, there is a whole um, uh, school of theory about the role of content in contemporary art. Like what is acceptable content? Should art have content at all? Mm. Uh, you know, the standard um, uh, formalist uh, Greenberg uh, reading of, of art in the mid-century was, no, you know, art was, is only what is present in front of you. It's only the material. It's only this object. It's a fully materialist uh, argument. And so any kind of content uh, has actually been, um, you know, has been under a lot of skepticism. Maurice Tuchman told me that when he was doing his uh, PhD in the late 50s, early 60s, um, at Columbia, in the program there, the idea that you would analyze a piece of artwork based on the artist's interests or what the artist talked about or what the artist said their intention was, was considered um, a joke. It was, you just didn't do it. It was completely unacceptable. And especially in relationship to the market now, if you have a piece of artwork and you load it up with certain kinds of content, it actually reduces the number of um, people who are interested in that work. So if I am overtly saying, this is my spiritual work and this is what it's about and this is the kinds of things that I'm talking about in that, it actually reduces the number of the pool of collectors who that work appeals to. 
And so there is this whole kind of tension in terms of that, that topic. Um, especially, you know, we're all supposed to be um, enlightened, postmodern, and, you know, the spiritual and the religious especially is something is superstition and we're leading, leaving it behind. And, you know, all of these kinds of standard narratives that have developed in the 20th century. So all of those things seem to really, uh, you know, resonate. I think in the last five years, a decade at a most, there has been this interesting kind of growth in artists being able to discuss the kind these these ideas and talk about being influenced by different kinds of spiritual uh, content. This especially has come through um, different kinds of feminist discourses within neo-paganism, uh, investigation into spiritualism and uh, women mediums of it just so these topics are very uh, are, are sort of have become open in certain ways um, you know there is we are you know the different kinds of uh, investigations of the sublime I think are also considered um, are still considered acceptable so it's a weird it's a weird relationship mm. um, I, you know, I, I feel like um, in the in America, less so that these things are acceptable. You know, the um, um, the East Coast, uh, Manhattan, and the the Ivy is here are are you know the Vatican City of of scientific materialism, and so there is a constant reinforcing of that um, hegemonic belief system in the in in the same centers where are the centers of the art institutions and um, art academic environments. So there is a, that definite tension there. But I, I do see more and more artists uh, being willing to invoke these things and being willing to say, uh, these are things that are interesting to me and talking about them publicly. So something has definitely happened. If you, if you accept the argument that I was making before that was shared with me uh, by, you know, elderly theosophists about cyclicality, uh, period, periodistic results, we are right in one of those periodic moments, mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, it's clear that the 70s were another one of these moments. The 50 years before that, 50 years before that. So there is this definite pattern we can see happening. And it's definite, the pattern is, you know, rising as well. It seems like there are more, but the uh, institutional resistance is still very um, prevalent. Well, <laughs> a lot of food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh... We've just got started. I know, I know. <laughs> just scratch the surface. Well, but... Uh, well, can I add one? Sure. Thing? Just to this idea about the receptivity towards uh, spiritual um, content in the art or, or artists evoking this, you know, I have always in some ways seen myself as something of a metaphysical activist. I think part of what came out of the conversation that I was responding to was that... Uh, you know, is that reality that um, I I was sort of, I have always kind of understood myself, uh, again, remember, coming out of these generations of religious workers, of proselytizers and things like that, um, as, you know, part of what I do is, is try to point out this connection and emphasize this history. And, you know, in a sense, like, take some of the, the criticism of these things to be able, you know, to sort of say like, yes, this is what I'm, this is what is important to me as an individual. This is uh, the content of my work. Um, and look like, um, I let me show you why historically this is, this is perhaps has always been there and has been, if anything has been suppressed, but, if you go and actually look at what the artists themselves are saying and what they've always been saying about what their motivations are, it never goes away, right? It's never like this is a trend. It's just like it gets pushed underground for a little bit mm -hmm. and then it comes back up. And so, but it's, that's happened enough now that you can say like, you can see the pattern. 
So I have always thought of part of what I am doing and part of my desire to say be associated with the Theosophical Society was to draw these links, you know, to mm. kind of be a living example of the reality of this constant presence in the um, creative activity of artists. You know, in some ways, I think that um, if you can expand an understanding of what the spiritual is, that's what we're really doing. That's what artists are always really mm, doing. Mm-hmm. You know, we can obfuscate it in certain ways, but somehow at its core, every artist is actually a spiritual artist, whether that spirituality is a strict materialism, whether it is a, a version of Christianity, whether it, whether it is a new age, there is some kind of metaphysical ideology, which is always underpinning what we do as artists. And, um, you know, I have thought of what I have been doing for many years is about, you know, that overused phrase of consciousness raising and, and simply like, you know, and as an, as an educator, as also being able to think about the, how we train and develop artists to say, this should be a part of what we do. We should be telling artists about these histories, because like you said, there's huge swaths of art history in the last hundred years that make little or no sense without that key. And once you have that key, the entire conversation changes. So that has, again, like, is an important, I think it's always been a very important part about how I understand what I do as an artist and as an educator of artists. Well, I thank you so much for sharing all of these insights with me today. I really appreciate, you know, all of these observations that you're bringing to the discussion because this is this is exactly what I was looking for. I was looking for this type of conversation that can be started, the dialogue that can continue with people sharing these these insights and and their, you know, their thoughts, their ideas about about what this is all about. What is, you know, you know obviously there, there, is, uh, there is engagement with this. Obviously people think that this is important. Uh, but because, like you said, there was this, this huge portion left out, I, I really would um, hope that, that I can continue this conversation uh, with you perhaps at a later time or with other people who might want to step in and also contribute to the discussion. I think this uh, trying to uh, recover this lost portion, I think would uh, would be really beneficial for, for many people. I know it's helping me uh, tremendously. So I really do appreciate you making the time to, to talk with me about all of this. I think this is really helping me to, to get towards my goal and also, you know, for, for your own self-expression. I think that's, that's also really important. So, uh, yeah. So thank you so much. I really, uh, I really do, uh, find this to be important work that you're doing as well. So thank you for sharing it with me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk about these things and I, I um, am always open to continuing this conversation and especially expanding it. The, you know, the more, again, the more of us that have this conversation, right, the, right. The, the, the more we are like literally raising a continent out of the ocean, right. you know, creating a new land to, to continue on. Yeah. And um, I really, you know, I think that these, these issues will only become um, more prevalent over the next century. Yes, I think I think you are correct. Excellent. I do have one more question. Are you uh, where or where are you most active on social media so that other people can uh, follow what you're doing outside of your own uh, website, www.michaelcarter.studio? Uh, if people want to just, you know, connect with you on a, on a day-to-day basis, where are you most often active? <laughs> That's not a really good question, a well-formulated question, but where are, yeah, where are you <laughs> most active on, on social media? Where can people uh, find you? <laughs> uh, in Instagram, obviously, okay. which is the same thing, michaelcarter.studio. Right. 
uh, that's my work more often to now on Twitter. It's become oh. a kind of form for dumping these ideas. It's a better, uh, I realized during the pandemic that everyone that I wanted to, the, um, the thinkers, the intellectuals, the theorists, that's where they were having these conversations. Yeah. I needed to go over there and talk <laughs> to those people. Uh, but in terms of my visual art, uh, Instagram definitely okay. is that. Right. Makes sense. Well, I will be uh, uh, certain to uh, include those links in the program notes, uh, along with uh, all the other references that I can uh, that I can that I can include uh, in there as well. And um, yeah, I'll just uh, end it. I'll close it with just another uh, very heartfelt thank you. Thank you. My deep appreciation to Michael for taking the time to talk with me and share his thoughts and opinions. Just as a reminder, the very important art catalog we discussed is titled The Spiritual in Art, Abstract Painting, 1890-1985. We only discussed one essay from this book, but it is filled with many more essays that focus on various aspects of abstract art, including essays on Hilma of Klint, The Alchemy of Marcel Duchamp, The Generation of Abstract Pioneers, Native American Art, and more broadly, The Spiritual in Contemporary Art. This book is really a gem. Please check out the program notes for more information about Michael's essay and lectures, plus links to more reference material and social media. I hope everyone is having a good 2022 so far. I'm having a bit of a slow start this year with a lot of delays, but I thank you for your patience. I have a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak, and I hope to have some interesting stuff ready for you in the coming weeks and months ahead. If you enjoy this podcast, please give it a positive rating and share it with others via your social media, if you would. I greatly appreciate that. Okay, that's it for now. Take care, everyone. And as always, thanks for listening.